we need to have a conversation about the way things were like 2,000 years ago. Like, I'm not totally sure that we can appreciate just how disorienting and how uh, difficult and how different it, it must have been to be a Christian in the first century world they lived in, right? Like, you know, you've got the Roman Empire that is putting everybody under their thumb. Culturally and socially, it's all Greco-Roman stuff, uh, which, you know, we'll get to a little bit, I guess. And I'm just not sure we understand just how disorienting it is to be a Christian, to be different in that culture. They all woke up every day feeling completely different and disoriented. Now, some Christians, I think, in the, in the early church and the, the beginning of all this, I think some Christians, they were sort of used to it, right? Because that's a lot of how it was when they were Jewish. You know, they were Jewish, and it was weird and different and disorienting to be Jewish in that culture. And then, you know, they convert to Christianity, and it's sort of just more of the same. But I think also, uh, I think, you know, because they were used to it, I think it was maybe even harder to be a Gentile Christian, uh, Gentile just being a fancy word for not Jewish, uh, because when they became Christians, they sort of had to make a, a clean break from their culture, uh, like divorce the culture, so to speak. Like they were used to it. They were at home within it. And then all of a sudden, one day, you know, they get baptized and now it's all different. And I'm just not sure we can totally appreciate how different it really was, even if, like, you think you know. So, for example, like, if I told you, hey, they're different back then, you're probably going to say, well, of course they are. Religiously, they were definitely different. And you're right, but it's hard to appreciate just exactly what that means. So religion in the ancient world, in, in ancient Rome, was everywhere because everyone was religious. You and I are used to living in a world in which there are some people who are religious and there are some people who are not. Like maybe uh, people who are maybe trying to do the right thing, who are maybe moral and ethical. Um, you know, a lot of parents trying to raise their kids become very religious. Uh, you know, you're trying to do that sort of thing. We're used to a world in which some people are religious and some people aren't. But in the ancient world, everyone is religious. Being religious, believing in the gods honoring the gods, worshiping the gods, recognizing the gods, praying to the gods. All of that is as common as like eating food or breathing air. Or when you go outside and the sun's real high, you get a little sweaty. Like it was just so, uh, it, it, it really, religion wasn't even a thing that was separate from life. Just everyone, good, bad, in between. If you were the most, you know, the holiest uh, person, you know, the, the most saintly person in the world, you were religious. If you were just the worst human that's ever existed, you were just as religious as the other guy. Because for them, religion was just, it just was. It was just self-evident. It was as evident as anything else possibly could be. Part of that was because of the, the people who were around, right? Like, th there was no separation of church and state. Uh, the, the, the Caesar in Rome was thought to be a god himself, right? So if, if your leader is a god, well, then, of course, you believe in the gods because, you know, you're looking at one. <laughs> like, there's absolutely no separation of church and state. Uh, the days of the week, the holidays you have, uh, just every custom you, you, you have revolves around your religion. But it's not just your religion, it's everyone's religion. What was your religion in ancient Rome was your home. So every home had household gods. Every home had their own unique deities that protected their own unique family. And so what that meant was every head of the household, usually a father, but not always, but every head of the household was essentially a priest. So you live in this culture where everyone is religious. Every, you know, head of the household is a priest. You have little gods, you have big gods, you have gods that are everyone's, you have gods that are just yours. It, it somewhat makes sense then that when cultures clash, they don't really fight about religion. And that might be a little bit surprising to us because in our world, boy, howdy do they. <laughs> you know, like people who are different religions very often go to war with, each other, go to war with one another over it, or even if they don't go to war, maybe they just are, you know, angry and hostile and tense. 
But in the ancient world, so we call it the Greco-Roman world because you had the two sides. You had Greek and you had Roman. The Greek comes from Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great, just he was good at conquering just everything and everybody. And he didn't just conquer, he made everyone Greek, right? The Romans, also very good at conquering, they're much less interested in making anyone a Roman. They just want your money. So that's really the difference between those two kind of empires is, you know, Greece wanted you to, to look like them. Rome just wanted you to pay your taxes so they could keep getting bigger. As a result, when the two cultures clashed, and you had Greece and Rome, you know, kind of butt up against each other, there was never any issue with religion. They just said, well, we're religious, you're religious, this is just how it is for everybody. We'll just say our gods are the same thing. Now, are their gods the same thing? No, they're not. But it was way easier <laughs> because everyone is so religious and there's no point in arguing and there's no point in fighting just to say, well, you know, Jupiter and Zeus are the same guy. Not really, but in, close enough that they didn't want to fight about it. This is the culture that first century Christians lived in. That's the culture. That's the world. Like when we read in the New Testament about Christians uh, living life and, and experiencing culture, this is the culture they were in. Okay? Christians were actually the ones who were not religious. They were irreligious. They were blasphemous. They, uh, sometimes they're told that they're atheistic because Christians believe that there's one God, which is absurd. There's millions of gods. <laughs> but Christians insisted, no, there's one God. And no, the Caesar is not it. And no, the household gods are not it. And they don't go to a temple. There is no Christian temple anywhere. There are no Christian priests at this point in history. Uh, their religious rites were like eating meals together. They called that communion. Uh, getting baptized is just dunking people in water. Like, this is the most uh, irreligious religion that's ever existed. It's basically not a religion. Following Jesus, being a Christian was essentially breaking from religion in the ancient world. And so it's no surprise to us that that causes tension and that causes difficulty and it's sort of disorienting. I mean, imagine being the tiny, 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 tiny minority uh, religiously and culturally in a culture that is uh, just everybody else essentially looks the same. But you probably knew all that. I mean, like most of it, like whether the details, you knew that like religion was a problem. There's actually more subtle ways that ancient Christians uh, kind of clashed with their culture. And one of those ways that was a little more subtle that I'm not sure that we always think a whole lot about is social classes. So in ancient Rome, there were six distinct social classes. At the top of the social ladder are the people with the influence, and let's be honest, it was about money, uh, the money to be within the Senate. Whether you were actually in the Senate or whether you just had enough cash to be in the Senate, uh, that, you, that was your social class. The very, very top, the senatorial class. At the bottom was a much, much massively uh, larger group and that was the slaves. And in between, there's four other groups that represent different uh, social strata. It may not surprise you to think that like senators don't usually hang out with slaves unless it's their own slaves, at which point that's not really hanging out. That's more, you know, ordering around and being served. And it's not like, you know, they're, they're not wearing like, it's not like the scarlet letter, right? Like they're not like wearing a sign that says like, oh, I'm this class or I'm that class. Like they don't do that, but it's very, very obvious who you are and who you are determines virtually everything about who you are as a person. So your social class, for example, determines where you are allowed to live. Your social class determines who you are allowed to marry. Your social class depends on uh, you know, what order you might do things when you're worshiping at one of the temples. Your social class uh, determines just like, I mean, literally just all sorts of things right down to like, if you went to the Colosseum, there was only certain places you were allowed to sit, sit. Like you couldn't save up all your money and then get box seats at the Colosseum. The box seats, those were for different social classes than you. And yeah, you can move up and down. Like there was, you know, it was really easy. Well, not 
really easy, but you, know, you were able to like, you know, get out of different social classes. Even slaves were able to like buy their way out of it. It was hard, but they could do it. Uh, you know, it was easy to go up and down the social ladder, relatively speaking, but like there was along the way, <laughs> you know, until you got to that point, there was really nothing you could do. That's how Roman life works. And how Christian life works is that there are no social classes. They don't exist. The way the Bible puts it is uh, man, woman, slave, free, Jew, Gentile, none of it exists. They are all one in Christ Jesus, which is to say this, in the church, everyone is equal no matter what they say outside of the church. So if you're a slave in the church, you're not a slave anymore. You're just not, like it just doesn't exist. That's not how this works. You are a brother in Christ. You are a child of God. And, and honestly, like that sounds great. Like that sounds awesome. But if you think about how like difficult that would have been in the day to day, you, you know, you're not within the community of Christians and you're a slave. You literally are property. But then you show up to church and suddenly you're expected to rise socially to be equal with everyone including like the very t tippy top people in society. Like you're equal with a senator. That would be really disorienting because you know, you gotta live one reality and then you live another reality. But equally disorienting and much more difficult was the opposite. We know from virtually day one of the church, we have very upper class people, uh, Roman people who are in the church. And when they went in the church doors, they were no longer nobility. It was no longer, yes, sir, how can I help you? <laughs> it was no, oh, ma'am, I will get you the manager. That's not the way it worked in the church. That is not how this operates, okay? There are not slaves within the church. So, like, if you have a slave and you're both Christians and you go to, like, a church gathering, guess what? That's not your slave anymore for the next four hours or however long the meeting was. I mean, that would be so hard to just do away with all of that, to leave behind your privilege and your position, to leave behind everything you as an upper class Roman feel like you've earned, even though you probably didn't earn it, you probably were born into it, but you would feel like you earned it because we all feel like we've earned everything even though we don't. To leave all that at the door to treat slaves and women and you know, just, I mean, all sorts of stuff. I mean, breaking every social battery, to leaving all that behind in order to be equal. Like you, upper class Roman, are now considered equal with a slave or a woman. I mean, it's just, it was so hard. And that leads us to Corinth. So Corinth is a city, it's very famous because we've got two very long books of the Bible. Paul pre, uh, plants his church. In, in Corinth, and then he writes in these two long letters. And what you guys, really easy rule of thumb in Paul's writings is the longer he writes, the more problems they have. Like, the more he's got to get to. <laughs> he's not just saying happy stuff for 16 chapters, okay? Like, he's, he's, <laughs> he's got a bone to pick, and then he comes back for 12 more. Like, that's just, that's just how it works. So Corinth is sort of a microcosm, okay? They're the very wealthy city, the seaport, very important Greek city becomes a very important Roman city, very wealthy, lots and lots of upper class people within the church, okay? And uh, the Apostle Paul is, is writing to them, and they've got some serious issues. There's two issues in particular that we see in 1 Corinthians that show us just how sharp the divide was between upper and lower class, even though there was not supposed to be any divide between upper and lower class. The first one, we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, where he talks about lawsuits between believers. And Paul is talking about how absurd it is that a Christian would sue another Christian, largely not just because of the lawsuit, but because why are Christians putting judgment in the hands of worldly judges, especially in Rome where they're not good? The answer, because you can't sue up on the Roman social ladder. Like slaves can't sue anybody. <laughs> and ones up above them are free men, they can only sue slaves. They can't, they, they, you can only sue down. 
So when Paul talks about lawsuits, he's directly talking to upper-class Christian people who have decided to make it their business to sue, (laughs) take advantage of, exploit the people below them on the social ladder, even though there ain't supposed to be a social ladder in the church, but they're doing it anyway. So that's the first problem. The second problem revolves around communion. We've already mentioned this a little bit, but like in our world, communion is like the trays and the little cracker and the little juice, the little wine or whatever it is. In the ancient world, they looked at communion very, very differently uh, because, well, communion is based on Jesus having a meal with his friends. And so in the ancient world, communion was having a meal with your friends. But what happened in Corinth, according to chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, is uh, the people were just saying, we're not going to let other people eat. And you can imagine who that might be. (laughs) You know, upper class people who brought the food, probably, who paid for the food, definitely, even if they didn't bring it because they have the money. Uh, They decided, you know what, this is our meal, it's not theirs. They ate all the food before the poor folks could eat the food. And Paul says, look, you have food at home. What are you doing? This is not about a meal anyway. This is supposed to be communion, and you're not doing it. He even talks about how some of the people are drinking all the wine and getting hammered drunk at church. And he says, what are you doing? You could do that at home. What are you doing? Like, this is not, you have completely missed the point. And when we look at this whole thing, look, I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to set up like this class warfare thing where I'm saying like rich people are bad or whatever. I'm just saying it's hard when you're used to getting your way, when you're used to having privilege, when you're used to everybody, yes, sir, no, mamming you, to then enter a room where suddenly you're equal with everybody. And nobody's impressed by your money. In fact, Jesus sort of talks about how money keeps you from the kingdom of God. Like, people actually are not, not only not impressed by your money, but they look at you and say, oh, man, that guy's got money. That makes Christianity harder. <laughs> like, they look at, they look at the, the rich guys with pity, right? And I am sure they tried. I'm positive they tried. I am positive that when Paul said, knock the lawsuits off, knock the communion shenanigans off, knock it off, be better, I am a thousand percent sure, positive in my head, that they tried. I'm also positive that it is not a coincidence that we read these words in Paul's second letter. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says this, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old self. He died for everyone, so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ, who died and was raised for them. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view, but how differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun, and all of this is a gift from God, who has brought us back to himself through Christ. God has given us this task of reconciling people to him, for God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message. Of reconciliation. It is impossible for me to put into words in the English language how crazy that passage is to a first century Christian. It's impossible. I mean, to us, this is one of those beautiful, poetic, nice passages. It is impossible for us to describe how radical, how revolutionary, and how fundamentally changing of everything that passage is, but I'm going to try. Jesus dies for everyone. Not a few people, not some people, not Christians, not the people who will accept him, not any of that. Jesus dies for everyone, period, full stop, which means every single human being has an inherent worth and value. Now, in our world, I'm not sure if you guys noticed over the last few years, there's been a lot of talk about which lives matter. I know, some of you guys are wondering, what's he talking about? Well, you know, 
That, that reference was subtle. In the Roman world, I'll tell you what the answer is as to whose lives matter. Basically, no one's. That's how Rome approached things. In the Roman world, we have to understand on a historical level, Rome was very, very, very good, but also Rome was sort of terrible at being an empire, okay? So Rome begins to expand. Little, just brief history, okay? Rome begins to expand. They weren't an empire that expanded for a long time. Then they decide, eh, let's give that a try. And they start expanding. And they begin this, this terrible, vicious cycle, okay? Because it costs a lot of money and resources to conquer people hundreds of miles away from you. It just does. Like, that takes a lot to do that. You got to feed the armies. You got to, like, send materials to the troops, like weapons and things like that, and, you know, like, you know, animals and just all the stuff. Like, that's a, that's a costly endeavor, okay? So immediately as Rome begins to, to expand, Rome becomes poorer, which means they have to get richer by expanding more, which makes them poorer, which means they have to get richer by expanding more, which makes them poorer. You see the problem? There's always money for the soldiers, always. Gotta have money to fight. But there was no money at home. People were starving. Men lost their jobs. People were kicked out of their homes. And people couldn't afford medical care. Babies dying because they can't get to a doctor. And people would go to the Senate. They would go and say, please help us. And the Senate says, ah, ah. It's like the shrug emoji is their response. Eh. If you die, you die. You know, what are we going to do? This money, that's for conquest. It's not for your food. <laughs> it's not for you to have a job. It's not for your medical care. And so Rome, ironically enough, was one of the most impoverished nations uh, in, the, in the world, like ever. They're one of the richest maybe the richest, you know, uh, up until that period of time, although there's a lot we don't know about ancient, the ancient world, but they also were incredibly impoverished. The vast majority of Romans had nothing and were more likely to die of homelessness and starvation than anything else. Whose life matters? No one's life matters in Rome, unless you're like a senator or a soldier. Basically it. So the idea that human beings have inherent, intrinsic value is absurd. The idea that every human being has inherent, intrinsic value was something beyond, I don't know what the word above absurd is. <laughs> and that's what Paul is claiming. Jesus died everyone. The cross of Jesus is for everyone and changes everything. So we don't look at people the same way we used to. I mean, you can basically hear him saying, stop with the social classes. We don't evaluate people from a human point of view. Human, pe human beings divide the world into the important and the not important. Uh, the, the, the people that, that we should care about, the people we don't care about. Paul is saying that is in no way what we do. We no longer evaluate people from a human point of view. He says we used to do that with Jesus. Jesus is poor carpenter that, you know, is poor carpenter from Nazareth that nobody cares about, right? And yet now we recognize that he's God in the flesh. The message is crazy. And guys, it's not just Rome. You're not going to look in the Old Testament and find this sort of message either. At least in practice, the Jews certainly didn't treat everybody the same way they treat, treated themselves. The Jews certainly didn't have any sort of equality within themselves. You know, like this is, this is a uniquely Christ-like Christian perspective that everyone is equally valuable. And when we look at the cross, that is the foundational, fundamental belief. The, the fundamental message of the cross is now everyone is important. Let me go back, actually. The fundamental message of the cross is now we understand that everyone is important. Everyone has always been important. We just didn't quite get it. And of course, that leads me to Christmas. Because I'll be honest, like, I don't need the cross to teach me everything I just said. Because Christmas does. You know, Mary and Joseph go to Bethlehem. Like, they can't find any room in the inn, so they go to this cave, they have this baby. 
rough night for Mary. Pretty cool night for the rest of us. Jesus, you know, born into this world, God you know, cries like a baby because God's now suddenly a baby. And the message gets sent out. And the message we read goes like this. Gospel according to Luke. Classic Christmas passage. I bet you've heard it. It goes like this. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to who? All people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. You will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. The angels established immediately, this is good news for everybody. It's not good news for Christians. It's not good news for Jews. It's not good news for the people who accept it. It's not good news for the people who believe right. It's not good news for the people who can live a good life. It's not good news for those people. It's good news for those people and also all the other people. It's good news for everybody. As an aside, if our good news of the gospel doesn't cover everybody, we're preaching a different good news than the angels did. If our good news is not good news for everybody, our good news is different than Jesus' good news. I'm pretty sure as Christians, that's not a thing we want. So maybe we should think that one through. But let's go back to this. It's interesting because the shepherds actually, uh, the shepherds actually end up sort of proving the point. The Jews don't have like the six social classes like in Rome. It's not the same type of thing where it's like, you know, you can't marry outside of your social class or like you can't go to the Colosseum and, you know, do all of that. Like that, you know, it, it's, it's not that. But the Jews certainly have people that other people care about and people that don't. And the shepherds, I mean, they just tick every box for thing, your people they don't care about. You know, they're poor. This is not a well-paying job. Even, you know, by the standards of shepherding, overnight, you know, the, the, the graveyard crew, <laughs> like that's not, the graveyard shift, that is not like the well-paying shepherds. These are like the bottom of a, of a, you know, this is like entry level into a poorly paying job. So they have no money and they, they just have nothing. And that's just how that works. Uh, on top of that, their job necessarily means they have to like touch dead bodies and things like that, which makes them religiously unclean sort of all the time. Uh, or if it's, even if they're not all the time that way, like there's the potential for that to happen all the time. So like religiously speaking, they're not really good religious Jews because of the, the stuff they're, that they're doing. And also like, man, it's, just, it's not even a pleasant life. You know, like, it's one thing if, like, you love your job and it doesn't pay well, but, like, there's no way these guys love their job. Like, it's cold, it's dangerous, uh, like, there's bandits, there's animals. You guys know these lions in this part of the world, in this place? Like, there's bears, not tigers, but lions and bears. Let's put those together because it's that thing. Oh, my, thank you. Yeah, yeah. But, like, ancient, <laughs> ancient Middle East has got lions and bears. That's crazy to me. That the, but that's, you know, that's the way life works. And so, like, they're protecting sheep. And, guys, sheep are, I, I hung out with a lot of sheep, but from everything I've ever read, sheep are real annoying. And they smell bad, and they don't listen. Like, there's a reason why Jesus gives the illustration of the sheep just, like, wandering off because, like, they're dumb and they do that. And so, like, this is not a pleasant existence for these guys. And yet, to those guys, whose, ple whose existence isn't pleasant, uh, God shows up, and, or the angels show up and say, hey, by the way, I just want to let you know, God was just born over there. It's good news for everybody. Better go worship him. They're the first people to be told, because their lives are important too. Because it's good news for them too. And of course, they're not the only ones, right? Like there's we, we know the, the look at the nativity, like you got the shepherds and the baby. There's also those guys in the funny hats, the, 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 the three kings from Orientar, right? None of that's right, and I'm pretty sure I'm not supposed to say the word Orient anymore. But like none of that's right. It's not where they're from, okay? They're not kings. There weren't three of them. It's crazy how like we didn't get that right at all. Like, the, the magi in the Bible, <laughs> uh, the people who actually, like, these things actually happen to, uh, they're Zoroastrian priests from Persia. I get, now that I say that sentence, why they changed to We Three Kings. 
way easier to say we three kings and Zoroastrian priests from Persia. But Zoroastrianism is a completely different language, a different, completely different religion, uh, totally different fundamentally from Judaism. It's real crazy, super fun, doesn't exist anymore, but super crazy. It's the wrong religion. Uh, these guys are priests of the wrong religion. They're from Persia, which means they're from the part of the world that like, uh, enslaved and put into exile the Jewish people. So they're from the wrong country. They have the wrong history. Uh, they got there by looking at the stars. Not supposed to do that. That's a sin. So now they're doing the wrong stuff. Like everything about the Magi is totally, totally wrong. And the Bible says they show up and worship Jesus and it's great. Because it turns out <laughs> Jesus being born, the good news of the king of everyone being born is it's truly that Jesus is the king of everyone. It's good news for everybody. I bring all of this up this morning because I think Christmas offers us a unique opportunity. You know, because we're all sort of in that reflective mode at the end of the year, you know. We're all sort of in a celebratory mode. Like people that I know that like barely care about Jesus like 11 months of the year are now all very Jesus-y for Christmas. It's great. Like, it's wonderful. We have a wonderful opportunity to, you know, to reflect. Like, we should take that opportunity and do it. Like, we should, do, we should use it. But I think when we take stock of what the meaning of Christianity is and what we so often do with it, I think we should actually probably make note that we're not super different than the people in the ancient world, you know? Like, they lived in a world that was super religious, and we do too. And I don't just mean, like, religion as far as, like, God or whatever. We live in a world where, like, the religious devotion of human beings in this country to all sorts of things is mind-boggling. The commitment they have to causes and ideas and ideologies, and it's not just one group. It's not just the people you don't like. I'm not attacking anybody. It is definitely the people you don't like, and it's definitely you too. But we live in this culture of like religious fervor, right? Like we don't just sort of like anything. We don't just kind of support things. We are just all in. But we're only supposed to be like that with Jesus, right? So it's hard to follow Jesus when we recognize that cultural Christianity has all sorts of other gods. And to recognize that cultural Christianity is so very, diff so very different than following Jesus, right? So different. Particularly, we recognize that cultural Christianity has no problem building idols. Maybe we're not so different. It doesn't matter if we baptize idolatry in Christian language, it's still idolatry. And you know the whole social class thing? Like, I think it's, I was talking to somebody about this you know, yesterday, actually. And it, it really, the only difference between us and them back then with equality is we give lip service to equality. <laughs> Where back then, they just admitted, no, nobody's equal. We totally give lip service to, yeah, everybody's equal. But then we don't treat anybody that way, right? So that's not helpful. Even the people who, like, fight for equality, they really only mean fight for equality for, like, those guys. I don't know if I've ever met anybody who wants to fight for equality for everybody. And I'm including myself. I've met me. But Christmas, man, Christmas, when the stories of, of the shepherds and the, 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 the magi, the baby Jesus, it, it's a reminder of what the cross is. That it is for everybody. That we don't evaluate people from a human point of view. That it doesn't matter what's going on in the rest of the world that we're called to something that's Christ-like. At the end of the day, Christmas is an opportunity for us to take a, step back, step, take a step back, take a deep breath and say, okay, what am I even doing? What am I even doing? What do I believe about Jesus? What does Christmas teach me? What does the cross teach me about Jesus? And when we can do that, I think we'll find they have the same message. It's not just Christmas. It's not just the cross. It's Crossmas. It's the last time I'm going to do that. It's Crossmas. And what we recognize is the inherent worth of every person. If, even if we don't like them, Christ does. And that's mind-blowing, guys. The people you don't like genuinely 
sincerely, for good reasons, Jesus likes them very much. <laughs> Jesus loves them. Jesus died for them. And so we don't evaluate people the way we want to from a human perspective. We recognize that's a person Jesus died for. That's a person. The message to that person is God doesn't hold your sins against you. That's what our reconciliation is. That's our message of reconciliation to the world is God doesn't hold your sins against you. See, now I'm meddling. Sometimes you stop preaching and you start meddling. And sometimes you do it to yourself. I got a lot of guys I don't like. Got a lot of people I don't like. They're not all male. Shouldn't have said guys. Like, a lot of people I don't like. And it blows my mind that Jesus is like, well, I do. What's your problem? And you don't have to like everybody, okay? We all have personality things, right? But we're called to treat everyone with respect and kindness and compassion and mercy and love. Because we are all equal. We are equal to, in the eyes of God, everyone else. And everyone in the eyes of God is equal to us. We all have value. We all have worth. The gospel is good news for all of us. The cross is for all of us. I don't know, I think we forget that sometimes. <laughs> I know I do. And Christmas, man, what a beautiful time for that reminder. This morning, we're in our third week, our final week of our series called Crossmas. What a dumb thing I came up with. I love it so much, and I also hate myself for it. Our third lesson is, is, is always applicable, and we need this reminder like eight times a year, I feel like. But Christmas will do for at least one. Our third lesson from Christmas is this. The cross and Christmas teach us that Jesus was born and died for everyone. So there's hope for everyone. Everyone's important. There's always hope for everyone. Everyone is important because Jesus was born for everybody and Jesus died for everyone. This morning, the musician is going to come forward. We're going to sing a song. Probably not very well. Just me. Christmas songs are hard. You need that to be known. Not very, they're not very easy. I don't know if I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that well. So, we're going to sing a song, but we offer this invitation each and every week uh, to take God up on this message of reconciliation, right? Uh, it says that I will hold your sins not, I don't hold your sins against you. That's really great. So the Bible teaches when we understand that, that we're to repent and be baptized. It sounds like two things. It's really just one. It actually sounds Jesus-y. It's really not. Repentance, all that means is change. That we want to change our minds, we want to change our hearts, we want to change our disposition to God. And the Bible teaches that there's a picture of that in baptism of us joining ourselves to God. Uh, in baptism, we go down in the water, it's like our old selves being put to death. We get out of the water, it's our new selves being born again, and we are with Christ. You never made the decision? Nice warm baptistry, all sorts of people can do it. Let's talk. If we're an immersed believer in Christ, we have a perfect church home, this place is not it. We do want to serve a perfect, we do serve a perfect God, and we do want to connect, we do want to call, and we do want to cultivate. We want to meet new people, we want to share the gospel, we want to grow up when we do it, and we want to live this Christmas, Christmas message uh, each and every day as we treat everyone we encounter equally with respect, knowing that each and every person we encounter, whether or not we like them, has value in the eyes of God. As we stand...